All right, you young guys, stop texting, all right? Focus, I need your attention. <laughs> Guilty. Guilty. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you can join us. This is a very busy weekend, and it just uh, warms my heart to see everybody here. Uh, thank you for your time. And for those of you who are live streaming with us today, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, we've got a wonderful discussion here. It's been a topic amongst Haggerty and amongst the panelists, and I believe amongst the hobby. What is the next generation, what is the shift, what's happening in this hobby, where are the next generation of drivers, enthusiasts, what's going to happen in the market? And that's the big question that we want to address today, and that's the title of our presentation, which is the generational shift in car collecting. To help us kind of answer this question, or even debate it, and bring in new perspective, we've assembled a pretty remarkable panel, and I want to introduce you uh, to this amazing group of gentlemen, and we've got Two dynamic groups. You can see we've got, uh, well, the sippy cups um, on the far end, representing our millennials and our Gen Xers. You know, this is uh, this is how we roll. You know, because while water. you're texting, you've got to have. Uh... <laughs> as long as it has vodka, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed. There's no Viagra samples for the three of us <laughs> and martini glasses. Martini. <laughs> you wash it down with gin. If you... <laughs> So I'm going to go with uh, our senior panelists here today, and I'm going to start off and introduce Mr. Rob Sass. Rob's here in the middle. He is our vice president of content for the Haggerty Media. He's also the publisher of Haggerty Classic Cars magazine, which all of you got a copy in your gift bag this morning. Joining Rob, we've got Donald Osborne. He is a classic car consultant, historian, and writer, also an accredited senior appraiser with the American Society of Appraisers. And directly to my left, Mr. Dave Kenny. He is also an accredited senior appraiser. And he's also the publisher of Haggerty's Price Guide, which you've also received uh, in your gift bag this morning. And this will come in very handy throughout the rest of this weekend. So keep an eye on that and save your questions for Dave afterwards. <laughs> or not, depending or not. on what happens. Or since we're here, just double every price in the book. You'll be fine. <laughs> That's how we do it, huh? OK. All right. And in the far corner, we've assembled an amazing group of gentlemen here with great perspective, on the ground intelligence, very active in the social community and the new generation of car collectors. In the middle, we have Dan Stoner. Dan is the founder and publisher of The Auto Culture, and it's with this background of, of new generation he has been recruited by Hemmings Motor News as their director of new marketing. We all know Hemmings and appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a big job ahead of him. <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> You're already late. <laughs> Next to him, we have Ezekiel Wheeler. He is a uh, transportation design student from Art Center College of Design, as well as a freelance writer covering topics from automobile restorations, restor uh, excuse me, motorsports, and uh, sort of sports tuning as well. And on the far, far corner, we have Mr. Rory Carroll. He's uh, semi-retired from his racing career in the 24 Hours of Lemons. <laughs> and in between his uh, pit stops, he's uh, decided to join us today and also spends his time as the editor at Auto Week. Uh, so thank you, Rory, for coming. And thank you for the rest of the panel. This is going to be fun. <laughs> We've got a big discussion in a big group. And uh, we're going to start off with, uh, again, our senior staff. We want to respect their time. And they've got valuable opinions. And very little and of it left. Respect our nap time. I know. It's and our early. attention spans. It's almost time for dinner. Um, let's <laughs> Come on. It's, it's not four o'clock. You're yeah. over special. <laughs> 
All right. Well, what we want to do is we want to debate and talk about some important cars that are going on right here. And we're going to kind of we've asked our panelists to pick some cars that they want to talk about that might represent um, what's the current day or modern day blue chips. And so we're going to go kind of through the line, open this up for some discussion amongst our panelists and um, give it a go. And I want to remind the audience that we're going to save some time at the very end here to pass around some microphones. I've got Laura and Ashley working the room. So towards the end, save your questions. We'll have a chance to ask the audience, excuse me, the panelists, um, some questions about their presentation today. And then we can save our, uh, our gar personal garage questions towards the end when the panelist is done. So let's jump right in. And Rob, let's talk about Continental Convertibles, which is your big pick here. This is a pretty fabulous car, and I think it's multi-generational. Yeah, I, I think so too, and I wanted to grab something that was a little bit more accessible. Um, Elwood Engel did this car, not one of the best-known designers of the 60s, but I think he absolutely knocked it out of the park. I think it's a fantastic-looking car, and it seems to turn up everywhere still today in the cable series Entourage, shows up on, in, in movies quite a bit. I think that this is a car that is absolutely never going to go out of style. You can take five friends along with you for the ride. It just, you know, I think it's it's always going to be in demand. Donald, what do you think? Well, my uh, pan-generational blue chip pick uh, is the Ferrari 250 GT short wheelbase, uh, a car that is an amazingly iconic car, probably the most beautiful uh, sports racing car the Ferrari ever made, uh, and also something which is rather affordable as those things go, you know, compared to GTOs and the like. Sure. Um, and one of the reasons why I picked this is because Ferrari, as a brand, will certainly span any intergenerational change in car collecting. Uh, Ferrari is, although the company is very small, they only sell 7,000 new cars a year, um, it's been rated consistently one of the most noted and, and aware brands in the, in the, on the globe. And an interesting statistic that I found was that Ferrari has 12.5 million Facebook fans, 55% of whom are under 24. Wow. Uh, Ferrari, Ferrari sold 7,000 cars, but they sold in the last 10 years $400 million worth of merchandise. So people will always be living the Ferrari dream, no matter what their generation. Zeke, what do you think? Are you a short wheelbase fan? I'm a weird kid. I'm still like the guy that still enjoys pre-war cars for my age bracket. Oh man! So I'm. I'm you want to come sit down here? I'm ruining <laughs> the rest of my life. No, that's really not how not. this was supposed yeah, to go. Yeah. We've won. Yeah, I'm one. That's it. So, for Ferrari, I mean, especially when you go to like school and you're with the school that I went to at Art Center, you fantasize about creating the next Ferrari, creating the next Alpha. You still want to be a part of those brands. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I completely agree with the selection. It's still something that is readily available for us to look at and enjoy and hear at the historics or, you know, maybe a cool neighbor down the street has one. So uh, it's it's a great selection. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, any of the, uh, sorry to interrupt, but, you know, any of these really scarce cars that only a few were made, you know, you don't have to find too many asses to fill those seats. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, you're always going to have a, a few thousand people who are there lining up to buy those cars when they're, when they're up for sale. So. I agree. I agree. Good pick, Rob. I like it. Dave, what do you think? You want to chime in here on your selection? Yeah, I've got the uh, 300 SL, and I, I picked the going, but I think you could substitute the Roadster just as well. Um, you know, you hate to use the word iconic, but I'll go ahead and use it. It's, it's among the most iconic uh, automobiles of all time because of its style. Uh, the the gold wing doors were, uh, uh, you know, certainly not that's the that's not the first use for them, but it was the first popular use in production for the for the gold wing style. Um, there the uh, the coupes are not all that practical to drive. They are easy bake ovens basically. Um, the windows don't roll down. You have to uh, you know release them and and take them out. Uh, so that does not make for a lot of driving pleasure, which is why you see a lot of them driving around town with their doors up. They're not trying to show off. They're just trying to cool down. Um, and uh, uh, they were the typical German over-engineered car, but over-engineering then is nothing like it is now. Um, they're actually quite easy to fix, although they are very, very expensive in terms of parts. They're not expensive at all to run. And Donald and I, two years ago, did the uh, the Gullwing group. Uh, we, we talked to them, and it was an amazing group of people. Donald actually asked the questions, uh, you know, who has owned their car more than five years? Every, you know, hand in the in the audience went up. Who's owned their car over 20 years? 
three quarters of the hands went up, and then uh, you know the people were asking, well, what about us original owners and people who've owned them for 50 years? Um, now that is now changing, and you can see it here this weekend. Uh, there's more gold wings here than than most gold wing group, uh, uh, you know, club meetings, and they're all on sale, uh, and as well as the uh, the roadster. I think these cars will survive uh, long, long, long after everyone in this room is gone. I'll see your two gull wing doors and raise the four suicide doors on the Continental. Ah. <laughs> and I'll blast past you all in the short wheelbase. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, anything from our uh, Gen Xers? I mean, the SLS is a modern-day interpretation of the Gullwing. I mean, I think that's pretty favorable. Yeah, what I've actually guys? had a few friends who are fortunate enough to jump in the SLSs, especially with the anticipation of the GT coming down the line as, like, the last naturally aspirated, uh, you know, Mercedes Gullwing to come out of the factory because we don't know when they'll revisit the design again. Yeah. So a lot of guys are investing in even just SLSs right now, and they're starting to climb. Interesting. Uh, in value as far as, you know, okay, I can't jump into a half million, you know, million dollar real going, but, so to speak, but now I can jump into this, so <laughs> it's kind of like 2.0. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Before we move on to the next slide, though, I mean, this was basically the, the geezer surmising what you guys are going to care about from our generation of cars. I mean, what, what do you guys think of these choices? You're 100% wrong. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think these are all fairly, uh, you know, not to say obvious choices, but they're they're cars that that um, you know the the market has shown at least recently there's an appreciation for um, the the Continental is an interesting pick. I thought that was probably the the bravest pick um, because it's a car that can be had for very little money today. Um, but I think it, it does strike an interesting or you know there's an interesting point there. I think. Um, those cars that are accessible but that are still pretty, that still have uh, interesting design, that still are very much of their era and that are also easy to service, have uh, been finding favor with a lot of my friends. Um, mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends picking up uh, 50s, 60s, uh, you know, early 70s American sedans because they're cheap and they're easy to fix. And compared to anything on the road today, they're very striking. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're very impressive to look at. Um, and, and, you know, really... Most of my friends, um, you know, if you pull up to uh, a bar in Detroit with a, uh, you know, an old 88, mm -hmm. it's just as impressive looking as, as something, you know, far more exotic. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, it, you know, it can be had for $10,000. Yeah. Not to mention the near Prius-like gas mileage. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the incredible efficiency. Yeah. Well, and just even in popular culture, uh, a car like the Continental, especially, I think, for maybe a millennial generation who doesn't know a world without MTV, if you turn on a video and there's going to be a video that ha needs uh, a classic car to, you know, kind of exude the personality of the rapper or the hip hop guy around it, yeah. it's probably going to be a Lincoln. Yeah. It's probably going to be a Continental. And like it or not, that's where the exposure happens first and foremost, usually. Yep. Yep. You know, so yep. that happens. Yeah. We see that a lot. Yep. I think that's a great segue into some of our next picks here. And I know uh, I'm guilty of growing up and watching a particular television show that uh, leads with Dan's here. And I. <laughs> Oh, man. Three words, Dukes of Hazard. Darn right. <laughs> or, or three more, Fast and Furious. I mean, it, when it comes to the Charger, uh, especially for the millennial crowd, you know, I mean, and I'll, you'll probably hear me say this again, but the Fast, the Fast and Furious movie franchise is now 14 years old. So it stands to reason that a kid getting ready to get his driver's license right now doesn't, again, doesn't know a world without the Fast and Furious franchise. So whether it's a 68 Charger or a 69 from the Dukes of Hazard, when I was growing up, um, even when the car was brand new and the boomer generation was buying them, I mean, those cars were marketed first for, you know, the guy wearing, like, the blazer and the turtleneck, and, you know, this is going to be the car he goes out in at night. And then as soon as, uh, you know, men started coming home from Vietnam, all of a sudden in 69, you see those colors starting to show up on the, you know, in advertising and sort of that, that very much that Peter Max bright, you know, poster work in the dealerships and stuff, and it was marketed then and sort of retooled by paint in some ways alone um, for the the guy who was going to get hip when he came home, you know. And so e from its inception, I think the Charger has this sort of pan-generational vibe to it that is even still relevant now. Yeah. Mainstream media, I mean, uh, Bullet. I mean, that's right, just bullet. <clears throat> another fabulous film that, you know, featured that car and all its hubcaps. 
<laughs> All 16 hubcaps. <laughs> and living in San Francisco, I can tell you that there's still some of those hubcaps down there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Rory, you're on deck here, man. Let's talk about Porsches. So uh, obviously we've seen the air-cooled um, 911 market take off in the last year or two. Um, and I think, and in, in maybe to a larger point here, I think we're starting to see... Um, a different thing happened with with collecting and with people getting into the old car hobby. Um, for people of my generation and younger, it's it's less. Um, you know, traditionally you'd hear this narrative about uh, a car as a way to to reconnect with your youth or a, a nostalgia object or or some um, you, you know looking back to your youth. Um, and we're seeing at least you know among my friends, among the younger people that I know who are um, who are getting into cars, are getting into cars not to reconnect with their youth necessarily because, you know, a lot of the cars they end up with were, you know, precede them by 20, 50, you know, 60 years in some cases. Let's face it, the cars of your youth were pretty crappy. Well. <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily. The cars you actually just for... recently bought one. Yeah, the cars that I own. What, owned... a 40 XP? Yeah. No, you're, you're a Ferrari. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I like my 940 Oops. Volvo. Well, Thank to be fair, answer. I was about four years old when Rev's Ferrari came out. So. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> hard to call that, call that a car of my youth, but I think, again, you know, you're looking at a, a situation where um, where young people are starting to value um, cars not as a way to connect with, with something in their past, but because they're intrinsically valuable. Um, that's why I picked the 911, uh, because across the spectrum of air-cooled cars, they're very good to drive. They drive, um, you know, especially as it gets a little bit later, they drive very much like modern cars. Um, they're easy to fix. They're... Um, you know they're they're very uh, uh, user friendly, I guess I'd say, and that's that's I think something that's going to keep them valuable. But it's going to keep a lot of other cars, uh, keep a lot of other cars valuable too. And I think, um, you know, as long as long as there are 911s out there, there's going to be a home for for most of them. And I think a lot of that started to go on, but I think a lot of that is driven by Porsche's uh, you know, huge departure in the last generation of 911s, coincided with a huge spike in early air cooled 911 values. And I have to think that there's something to that. You know, Porsche starts building a 911 that's not really a, a 911 in the traditional sense, and then all of a sudden, traditional 911s become very valuable. Yeah. Um, I don't see Porsche going back to, you know, walking that back towards a more traditional 911. Let me so. ask you a question, Ray. What do you think is the appeal of a car made before you were born, as opposed to the cars that Porsche is making now? What is the difference between those cars that appeals to you specifically? Um, I think the the simplicity of the design. Uh, I think there's there's a huge um, push to make things complex and make things interactive and make things computers. And um, for me, you know, for someone who drives an, a brand new car through Auto Week every day, it's really nice to get an analog car that I can feel and like understand. And like and and not so much understand. I mean, I, I understand a lot of the technology in the new cars, but um, you know, I can't interact with those cars in any real way. That's fantastic. You, you've just stated something that I believe very strongly that I state to people and certain people, whoever they might be, Rob Sass, um, oh. <laughs> wanted, to, wanted to hear this from a millennial rather than from me, um, the fact that, and I want to hear from all you guys, that as things become more digital and automated, that the appeal of the analog has got to be, I and mean, it goes back to brass era cars. I mean, mm -hmm. these are blacksmith's cars, basically. Right. It's, you see yeah. everything that goes on. Yep. And is that true? Does it have that appeal for that reason? I think it's, if I could jump in, I think that um, to those to those points, um, the maker movement, you know, the hacker movement, the idea mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, especially with the millennial crowd, that you can build your own computer and your own hard drive, or you can build, you can go to the Maker Fair in San Mateo or buy Make Magazine. Um, you can go to, you know, um, Burning Man, for God's sakes, if you want. But that yeah. maker that maker attitude and the fact that, you know, an analog car is so easy to hack yeah. and to get into, that has a lot to do with the custom world, too. But I think that there's just such an appeal to that. You know, it's accessible. Accessibility. Well, I, I mean, you can even go simpler, even uh, vinyl versus, uh, you know, uh, uh, MP3. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's, there is. Yeah. It's true. iTunes. That's what you're both fighting for market right I mean, vinyl right is now. having so true. Yeah. Vinyl's having a revival right yeah. now. I mean, it's obviously yeah. doesn't sell anywhere near like it did in in my day, but. Uh, um, and people like the purity of it and the simplicity of it, and, and, and it is both things, pure yeah. and simple. And there's also there's also an occasion to it, like there, um, 
people younger than me, people you know, people who are my my little brother's age, um, pr all of his friends only buy vinyl. Yeah. And it's because there's a there's an occasion to it. And it's the same with an old car too. It's something special. It's not like a disposable. Um, you know, there's a package. There's a there's a whole. Um, like I said, there's. You know, How do you download ritual. vinyl, though? Yeah. Yeah. It can yeah. be done. We have a 3D printer that can yeah. do that. But, yeah. You know, it's. I mean, the, the whole technology backlash thing, though. I mean, I've heard the exact same argument among people who collect wristwatches. You know, 30 years ago, quartz was going to absolutely bury mechanical wristwatches, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a backlash against How having. How old are you again? Yeah. He's 110. <laughs> uh, that's also though why we now wear wristwatches as jewelry because we got our time for my cell phones. Right, right. That's correct. Hey, I have, a, I have I an have automatic watch, yeah. right here, so I'm, I'm nice. doing all right. For yeah, well, guys. exactly. Yeah, it's, it's nice to be the only person on the airplane who can actually tell what time it is because yeah. I don't have to turn my watch on yeah. to do that. So. <laughs> if I could for a second, I do want to return back to Donald's question about what draws us to those particular vehicles, and it's not, like Rory said, a connection to our youth, but I think it's a connection to what we experienced during our youth. So I think it has a lot to do with us wanting to be like dad or be like the cool neighbor that was down the street and actually finally have that car that the neighborhood will talk about or that you can take out and wash and be proud of. And then on top of that, the next generation is going back to craftsmanship. So mm -hmm. much crap has been produced that we keep having to buy belts. We keep having to buy watches. We keep having to buy all these things, and we're going back to can't you just make it right the first time? Yeah. <laughs> so there's a big resurgence. There's a brand called Kill Spencer who specializes in leather goods, and he makes them all in Los Angeles, bags, backpacks, belts, you name it. But it's done with a level of craftsmanship that you haven't seen since yeah. when these cars came They're out. They're making so, chargers. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Right. Half of the uh, contemporary Detroit economy is people making stuff. Yeah. 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 Wildly expensive leather goods. And, yeah. But it's stuff, and yeah, people people yeah. want to buy permanent goods, um, which are you know these old cars who have been here for 50, 60 years. Um, but I think I think there is a um, a, a really uh, you know when I when I tell people uh, or when I come across people um, who aren't into cars and it, you know I tell them that um, you know my my Willys runs because you know I because I work on it and I I do all the stuff on it like. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my 911 does not run because I don't work on it. But, uh, people are impressed by that. I mean, especially young people are are really impressed with with someone who has the wherewithal to um, to you know to take on a, a mechanical project and, and make it work just because it's so rare. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a, a huge a growing appreciation for that. Um, and I think that the old car thing really feeds into that. Um, cause it's a visual symbol of like. Mm -hmm. Competence, you know, like. <laughs> and speaking of like build quality and craftsmanship, I think that all kind of gets wrapped up in Zeke's next car. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell me more about this Toyota 2000 GT. Yeah, for a second I forgot I picked the third car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this goes with the next generation of growing up with Fast and Furious or the little Hondas that would invade all the hot rod meets and things like that. These guys have now had time to mature in this passion. It's been 14, know, 15 right years. Right. Well, maybe not right. totally mature. <laughs> they're older. They're 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 older. They've, they've done their research now, and they've figured out that their MR2 comes from somewhere. They've figured out that the Hachiroku comes from somewhere, mm -hmm. and that comes from this particular, the, probably the most beautiful Japanese car to mm -hmm. ever emerge, and that it's just something that won't go away. Mm -hmm. It's something they're going to want, and this will be their top, the, the pinnacle of their collection. Okay. This will be that. And I think there's a few on sale this weekend, is that correct? One? <laughs> yeah, one, yeah I think there's one here. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's another car with, you know, incredible scarcity. Again, you don't yeah. have to find a, a huge pool of, of buyers to uh, to sell all the 2000 GTs. No, no. And it's just fun to see one turn up, especially yeah. I live down in Los Angeles, so when the Long Beach J like Japanese Heritage Show shows up, I mean, you cannot get enough kids to not enjoy this car. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how old they are. They I remember just enjoy it. I wrote something uh, uh, years and years ago, not years ago, three or four years ago, but the, the one was listed for $275,000 or something on eBay, Ooh. and it was this huge controversy. Like, just... Oh, I, my yeah, God. The audacity, I would never pay yeah. that. The audacity <laughs> of that. That, that <laughs> same guy is probably going to sell that car for... Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. several times. Well, there's a generational gap. It would take about 10 to 15 of your buddies to pull enough <laughs> yeah. money together. Yeah. 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 Just to look at it. Yeah. Collaborative ownership. Dave, you've been kind of quiet down here. Have you kind of stumped here on this next generation, or? No, I, I think um, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna do just like Rory did. I think his 911 was the obvious pick. Um, I like the uh, I, I like the Charger, but uh, isn't that um, you know the 68 69 Charger? Isn't that the reason Chrysler is still in business right now? Because yeah, that's, that's what they're building. Yeah. Um, is that the Fiat? A yeah. tribute to that. It's actually a, <laughs> hey, I have a 20 year old Mercedes technically. And the, uh, the Mercedes, you know, yeah. as you could expect, the 2000 GT. I couldn't agree more. Um, but you know, there's what 250 of them in the world, mm -hmm. and they're now routinely a million and a half to two million dollar car. Uh, so they're they're getting out there. I would have, uh, you know, maybe the Mazda Cosmo that's coming up yeah. would be yeah. a great pick. That's a over that's Gooding. And uh, you know, when I was there yesterday, there was more press attention on that car than any of the multiple million dollar cars. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get close to it uh, all day to take a look at. It. That was security doing their job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, that's you're, you're, you're coming. I think yeah. to be fair, you're not legally allowed. But if you, if you need some, uh, if you need some <laughs> cigarette letters and ashtrays from a Cosmo, come talk to me later. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I, I can't uh, comment on these picks until you actually see the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> this, this next slide is good. We're going to be shifting oh, yeah. gears a little bit and, uh, and talking about some of the cars that may be falling out of passion, maybe taking a, a little bit of a lull or hiatus before they come back. As we all know, this industry is very cyclical and uh, it can be generational. So that's why, that's why we're here and why we propose the question. So, Rob, you are at the batter's box. Yeah. <laughs> 50s and 60s, you know, um, mainly American four-door sedans that don't have, you know, some sort of a pop cultural touchstone. Were featured in a in a movie heavily or something like that. And I sort of base this on what I've heard from dealers and talking about pre-war cars and saying, yeah, you know, the icons of the pre-war era, yeah, the the next generation that didn't uh, have a connection with them growing up has adopted, you know, the the truly iconic pre-war cars. But you know, sort of the run-of-the-mill. Dodges, Chevrolets, Maxwells of the you know the twenties are, are really sort of tough to move right now. So by extension, my thinking is that that sort of uh, you know fifties and sixties you know, quarter American sedans might be uh, might be kind of tough going forward. But I know you're going to disagree with me in the end. Oh yeah, it's, a, it's 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 hipster cars. I mean that's a, well, you, you go to Portland all the time. I mean yeah. what populates the streets <laughs> yeah. but DeSotos. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's Havana in the uh, northwest. Yeah. I mean, you know. Havana on the lake. Yeah. More ways than one. Yeah. I, I do, I do take issue with that to to a degree. Um, you know, I think I think these cars are now again. It, it's it's now a matter of of not necessarily um, connecting with something in your youth or connecting with something, some piece of pop culture, but appreciating the cars for what they are. Uh, you know, as to either works of design or works of engineering. I think, um, you know, I know I know plenty of people in in Detroit who are who are driving 1950s and 60s uh, American sedans, uh, fixing them up, restoring them, spending money on them. Um, you know, it's it's not something that probably has reached the uh, you know the, the dealer level or the auction level or the the kind of industry level. But um, at the grassroots level, I can say that those cars are are very popular. Um, the other thing that's interesting about that is, you know, I spent um, some time in Sweden at the Power Big Meet last year, <laughs> and they can't get enough of those cars. Oh, that's um, it, it, it's it was the it was the it was a car, uh, you know a, a huge collector car event, uh, you know as big as anything in the U.S. If not, they say it's much bigger. But um, what struck me the most is it's all kids. It's not. I mean, there it's there's a few older people, a few adults, but it's all. You know, 20 and 25 and 19 year old kids um, riding around in the trunks of old American cars, drinking horrible cheap beer called Falcon. Which I do not recommend. Uh, and uh, and partying, and that's that's something that um, you know I think if if those Swedish kids can get into those cars and do get into those cars, and American kids are getting into those cars, I, I think they have a future um, because they're they're beautiful, they're striking cars, and they're not like anything you see today. Yeah. And Sweden's the second largest uh, population of American classics outside the U.S. They say they yeah. they say they're bigger. They that's what they say. I don't know they if that's that. <laughs> yeah. They would say that. <laughs> they would say. Bless their hearts. Just uh, by yeah. This. Um, I pick the uh, Porsche 911 S. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're just going uh, away. Just What's happening here, Donald? Um, it's interesting, actually. The reason why I picked the the 911 um, is somewhat 
obviously of a contrarian point of view, which is the fact that there will be, I think, people who have grown up with these sort of luxury Panzerwagen Porsches, and they will identify Porsche with a super high technology uh, car, and they frankly might relate better to the oldest car, might be maybe a 993 Turbo, but they're going to relate to the new cars, perhaps to the, well, I see that's coming in a later slide, so I won't talk about that, um, to, to cars that are not um, these sort of basic, uh, very difficult to drive. Uh, early 911s are horrible to drive, the reason why Porsche developed them so fast, to get rid of the, the driving characteristics of those early cars. Um, and they might still be attracted to a 356 because it is another, of, another, of another era. So um, I thought that 911s, because there's a lot of them around, and I thought they might uh, sort of fall out of favor with a lot of people. Rory, you're right. Donald, you're wrong. Okay, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not even going to answer that. <laughs> Um, my pick, uh, 57, 55, 56, the Tri-5 Chevrolets, um, they won't resonate with the re next generation as they resonated with the baby boomers. Uh, they were, once again, a car that, that kind of was, uh, you know, at some point, um, $125,000 car for a well-restored Bel Air convertible. Um, I think those days are probably over. It doesn't mean that the hipsters won't adopt them, but they'll adopt them at a lower level. Uh, I still think the cars are interesting, and of course, the What's happening to the lesser cars is they're being resto modded right now, mm -hmm. which is another yeah, complete of other customs. other uh, discussion. But uh, when you have a 50s custom that you want to make look really, really nice, and you realize you're going to have to invest $25,000 at a minimum in chrome, all of a sudden, um, you know, black bumpers and a and a matte finish <laughs> yeah. is starting to look pretty darn good. I really so, like um, patina now. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You can you <laughs> leave the dirt on it, and and you can always you know do the fake patina like uh, people are doing as well. Yeah, so, I think uh, duple what? color makes yeah, it right. a spray exactly. can that yeah, right. does yeah, right. There's gambling in Casablanca. <laughs> yeah, like, so um, I think they'd be telling me people are turning vacuum cleaners in reverse to make barn finds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> I uh, that was my patented idea, by the way. You've got a lot of people to sue then. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, that, that, Tri-5 is a great example of the, the 55, 56, 57 Chevys. That was a car that I always associated with the um, the DJ Surfing Bird local cruising at the uh, yep, yep. the hot uh, fast food place, which is a scene that, that was always kind of a turnoff for me growing up. Um, and then a, a few years ago, I ended up writing a, an auction description for like four of them, like the same auction had like four of them in a row, and so I had to like find a way to differentiate or d differentiate and, and have something fresh in every one of the descriptions. And I ended up doing a ton of research on those cars, and came away really with an entirely new appreciation for the car. Sure. Which is, I think, um, again, you know, to go back to to my earlier point, I think with all of these cars, um, however mundane, and not to say that these are mundane at all, but um, once I think once you expose a car guy to to that sort of thing, once you expose a car guy to what's valuable and what's cool, like, you know, I related to this car now is like, you know, the BMW M5 of its day, like this total sleeper, you know, V8 powered, fast family sedan. Fuel injected. And yeah, and and really like a you know pretty important uh, part of automotive history. And it was like, wow, all of a sudden I really like that car. But I think, and I I didn't know anyone. You know, none of my family are car guys to speak of. Um, no one had anything like this in, in my neighborhood growing up. But you know, I have, I have an appreciation for that car because I learned about it and I was exposed to it. And I think um, you know, the same thing happened with pre-war cars for me. It probably happened to you. The, the more you look at them and the more you're exposed to them, the, the cooler they become. And but it doesn't think, make you want to own one. <laughs> oh, I, believe me. If if, uh, if this car does fall, <laughs> yeah, if this car does fall through, you know, these cars, all these old cars, if you know, if the market does drop out, I'll be right there waiting with a check. Yeah, <laughs> a twenty-five thousand yeah. dollar fully restored yeah. Bel Air convertible. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, you know, I, especially where if they're willing to take five bucks a month. Huh? You're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you give them twenty-five now. Yeah. So. Exactly. Why even when I first saw this, I thought, oh, Dave's crazy. There's no way. I mean, a fifty-seven, yeah, but a fifty-five was still cool. And I thought, you know. For, again, going back to the accessibility thing, for I know my group of friends, a 55 Chevy is only valuable if you put a straight axle under it, radius the real the the wheel wells in the back, and put a 383 under the hood. Well, there's 50 grand, you <laughs> yeah. know. So even with a flat black rattle can, you know, spray job, it's still 50 grand. And so I thought, you know what, Dave was right. 
<laughs> well, you Next saw slide. Hot Rod, Hot Rod <laughs> magazine when they put the Hemi inside of their gasser. Right, I right. mean, that's the next generation. They don't yeah. real. They're not going to stick to any traditional right. protocol when it comes to these cars. They're going to get them and say, "Well, this is what I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put a V10 M5 motor in it." Yeah, yeah, and I think there's there's a huge uh, kind of undercurrent, you know, along those lines of people breaking the rules just to offend. It's kind of like this punk rock aesthetic within right. within cars, like you know, absolute sacrilege just to offend the purists, which <laughs> yeah. I am a huge fan of. <laughs> but uh, we know how to find you. Yes. <laughs> So we're going to switch gears here and uh, keep talking about sort of what might sort of pause at its time. And and Dan, you picked something that I, you know, I'm based in Southern California, Los Angeles, at the Peterson Automotive Museum. So I see a lot of 32 Fords, a lot of great hot rods coming through there. That's really, you know, Southern California culture is based on this car. So I was shocked to see you pick this car as an unfavorable sort of future. I think so, and I think it's mainly be again going back to accessibility. Uh, a 32 Ford, whether it's a Roadster, a three window, or a five window, to find an original one, mm -hmm. and I mean, I've seen bodies, bodies alone for a five window, which is probably out of the three, is probably the least valuable, although that's hard to imagine. Um, just a rusted body alone go for 30 grand, you know, and that's and that's not that uncommon with doors, you know, and and a deck lid. Um, and you just scoff at it. I can't believe that this kind of thing would go for this amount of money. And I think what will happen is that while millennials will certainly appreciate the deuce, um, it's going to be jewelry that's seen in a museum. You know, it's not going to be something that if they're going to get into cars and old cars in particular, um, a 32 Ford or you know a, a Back to the 50s hot rod like that just isn't going to be something they identify with. Unless they're talking about their their uncle or their granddad or their you know something their dad might have rode around in mm -hmm. as a kid you know it was already a built hot rod sure. so I think f from an historical perspective they're going to appreciate those but I think they'll they'll fall out of favor simply because it's just not something that's going to be generally accept accessible compared to a '79 Monte Carlo you know mm -hmm. that's easy that's easy to find easy to work on you know those kinds of things so easy to put 20 inch wheels on. It'd be, 13-inch wheels with gold, <laughs> with yeah. gold dating. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the interesting things about the, um, the, uh, the Deuce Hot Rods is also that it is a very, very, very much a regional thing. I was born in, in Manhattan, grew up in New York City, and there was all never cars a are yellow and have lights on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly, but. Um, there were, and there was a, a thriving hot rod scene, God knows, in the Northeast, but it wasn't built around um, Deuces. Right, um, right. There were all sorts of other cars, and I think that, to your point, about the expense of finding a, a real one goes back to what Rory said, though, that there are a lot of people who just want the look. So they don't care if it's a fiberglass car. Mm -hmm. Right, that's true. So, yeah, so yeah, I, think that, that I think that for some people, again, that just want sort of the hipster vibe, it's sort of a hip thing mm -hmm. to have, mm -hmm. but I think it's very much a regional thing, and, and so that's I think that will live and die yeah. that way. I, I was in like the, the steel bodies. You can get yeah. repop steel that looks just, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was at the LA Roadster show recently, and I hadn't been in a while, so I thought I'd go check it out see what's going on and this is the first time walking up and down the rows that I actually was like I could probably walk away with one of these today mm -hmm. and I was like I never thought that in my life that a flathead all steel body 32 would be in my price bracket and I was like that's not a good sign <laughs> I'm still far too young so. have you become rich recently or yeah, yeah. Money. yeah really is that the, is too that young the or too much money yeah. Rory, so I was uh, kind of stumped here, and I thought, okay, Rory's got definitely something up his sleeve. I'm thinking ghosts. He chose yeah. the, he chose the white with white anniversary yeah. Countach. You just yeah. can't you see You know it. the color. No, it's a white on white on white uh, it's a, it's a sedan Countach. Deville from yeah, 1987. Yeah. And a pile of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> most of them ended up at one point or another. Um, I really, I really struggled with this. I, I think, um, you know, I to try to find a car that will not be appreciated. I think. Something that Dave said um, is is definitely true. I think you'll see, um, it, you know, Dave said these cars uh, will never struggle to find a home. It's just gonna, they'll find a home for much less, yeah. which I think is is something you're going to see, you know, with a lot of different cars. But that's that's the kind of constant fluctuation and, and adjustment of of the collector car hobby that's been happening, you know, since we've been collecting cars as a hobby. Um, but I do think. Um, one thing that came to mind this morning that's going to be difficult 
uh, you know, anything that is customized or modified uh, very much to someone's own personal taste, I think, is going to be something that um, may be hard to find a home for in the future just because you know, who wants to put right or who wants to make someone else's idea of a perfect car into their idea of a perfect car when you can just start with a fresh car unless it's something really unique and, and hard to get. Um, you know, most, most people would rather start from scratch than, than fix someone else's idea of what their perfect resto mod is. But the difficult thing with that is, is I think we underestimate um, the, the generation of me and a little bit younger, their capacity for irony, which I think is probably <laughs> the most highly tuned uh, the, uh, appreciation for irony yeah, outside, outside of Dave Kinney. <laughs> um, Dave Kinney, who actually started the ironic collector car hobby thing uh, years and years <laughs> Those ago. Those weren't ironic. <laughs> yeah. He tells me they're ironic now. I think that's exactly. Yeah. But um, I was ironic when ironic wasn't cool. Yeah, <laughs> you're ironically ironic. Uh, but I think you know, I find myself looking at um, ads for you know ZZ Top grade fiberglass 32 Ford, um, you know 1980s style with the big graphic, thinking like <laughs> the I, lightning bolt down the side. Yeah, like yeah. If, if I was you Great know if Beach was a popular yeah, color. Yeah, if I was a 65 yeah. year old guy in like a Hawaiian shirt and I got out of that car, everybody's like, okay, that makes sense. But if I got to that well, car, all the 65-year-old guys in Hawaiian shirts, please not attack Roy yeah. until after <laughs> the seminar. Thank you. But uh, <laughs> he'll be leaving early. But you know, if I got out of that car, that's pretty funny. Like that's you know that's a that's legitimately a funny thing <laughs> for me to drive. <laughs> and if those get cheap enough, I'll be right there because that's, that's hilarious. Right, and there's a lot of cars like that. You know, I I, I don't want to really give you too much of a window into how my brain works here, but uh, <laughs> or fails to work in a lot of cases. But uh, like, I think that the ironic car thing um, is going to provide a lot of homes for those types of cars. And, it, you know, you've seen it throughout, you know, anyone at Concord of Lemons, um, not anyone, but a lot of those guys buy cars not because they're great cars yeah. or because they're cool, but because they're funny. They like dumb. The existence yeah. of Concord of Lemons <laughs> just yeah. proves right. the, the <laughs> incredible popularity of the ironic car, which yeah. uh, just makes these two guys just heaven on earth. That's it. And, Rob, they have the same thing in the U.K., right? They do. They do, as of uh, two weeks ago. What was that called? The Festival of the Unexceptional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you know, if you want to see the best Austin Allegro or Morris Marine on the planet, you missed your chance. <laughs> two weeks ago at Silverstone. <laughs> uh, I, I want to hear about the T-Bird. Uh, yeah, is... Zeke, you've got you picked a good one here. I mean, Suzanne yeah. Summer is just a chat. special. <laughs> yeah, it's not that I'm not a fan of the T-Bird because I am. I really am. There's a guy down the street when I grew up, and he restored them, and they were beautiful. He did exceptional work to them, and I think I put this in here because I'm hoping all of you sell them for really cheap. <laughs> so, uh, no, I think unfortunately for American roadster cars of that era, there's just no connection for the next generation to enjoy them. There's been no pop culture surrounding them for us. There's been no, uh, you know, heavy feature. Uh, magazines that we're a part of or, or blogospheres or videos for us to actually understand and appreciate what America was doing in the 50s from a sports car pers perspective outside of the muscle car, before the muscle car. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, aside from the Corvette, you're really going to have a hard time finding someone to say, yes, I will spend $100,000, $200,000, $80,000, $90,000, $70,000. Mm -hmm. They're just going to say, why? Can you tell me more about the car? And it's just going to be a longer, drawn-out discussion for them. Well, that, that's, um, that's a great pick, uh, Ezekiel. And, and I, I've been saying this for years about that car. There's another couple of reasons. I'm 6'4". I look like a weeble when I drive that car. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. But you're perfectly at home in your smart car. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, but Dave, is that or is that not hilarious when you drive that car? Uh, I, I mean, it, irony, it is, you're it, part of the irony. It is, it is. I am looking right out at the header bar. Yeah. And the other thing is we're taller and, you know, uh, a few of us on the panel here can testify we're wider than the generation who... Uh, I'm working you know, on it. Yeah, I'm I know. Um, yeah. Who, uh, yeah. who was, was at home in those cars. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's another thing that you have to think about because I can't drive a Model T. I can't drive a Model A. I just can't fit in them. My knees are that far away that, uh, you know, even if I, uh, um, you know, I mean, it would just be impossible to drive some of these cars. And with, uh, you know, with with taller people, it makes it tougher. Um, the other thing that I've, I've noted about the 5567 Bird is a lot of people who are potential owners of that car have now bought the last series of Thunderbird. Mm -hmm. They get the same look. 
the, well, to them, I know, I yeah, know, yeah. to a lot of people, the same look, the same yeah. kind of attention-grabbing thing. And, of course, the press hated those cars when they came out because yeah. they weren't sports cars. They were boulevard ears. I like those cars. But everything works in them, and they have air conditioning that actually blows cold. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for a lot of people, that's their choice for their, you know, beach car or whatever. So I, I'm a contrarian. I, 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 I am, too. I uh, talked about that <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Um, first of all, I think that these cars for um, a millennial generation – appeal purely on their style, and they're incredibly stylish cars. As, as industrial design of the, of the decade, they appeal for that reason alone. Um, also, if you accept the driving dynamics of any 1950s cars, they're not bad cars to drive. Uh, and also something that uh, Dave and I were talking about, and I think I spoke to Rob about this as well, strangely enough, as far as the values are concerned, they've been on a plateau forever. Yeah. yeah. Right. And they slowly started to rise. Until you started looking for that mythical $25,000 <laughs> nice baby bird driver that's supposed to be behind every ornamental shrub. Exactly. Yeah. That's why that's I put amazing. it on this list. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think, though, and again, to get, you know, on paper, this is a difficult car for a younger person to appreciate until they get in one, or until right. they see one up close, or until they have some experience with one. And then all of a sudden, it starts to make sense. I mean, these cars, you know, as different as generations are, you know, as different as I am from my dad and from my grandfather, um, in, in a lot of ways, we're not all that different in terms of what what is appealing aesthetically, what is appealing, um, you know, kinetically or, or, or in, a, in a driving experience. We're not all that different. And so... So while you know looking at a two hundred thousand dollar T bird crossing an auction block is a very abstract thing, the second you're in one, or the second you see one up close, or get to work on one, or whatever, all of a sudden it becomes real, and then it can start to become very attractive, which I, I think is something you see across the board with with all these cars. Yep. And looking ahead uh, to the future, we've got some important cars to talk about, but I I just want to pause a moment and just give a shout out to the young man sitting in the front row. Uh, what's your name? Nolan, how old are you? Nine. Nine. I'm glad you're here today. You've been We're so attentive. We're all glad you're here. <laughs> you haven't looked at a phone. Hey, you haven't played with a mechanical device. <laughs> uh, and you're paying attention. <laughs> Nolan, I'm glad you and your dad are here this morning. Thank you for joining us. It's good to have you. All right, so let's switch gears and talk about the future and figure out what's what's going to happen next and what what's going to be collectible in the year 2035, 2045 for the uh, the boomers. What's going to be important still? Yeah. And Rob, you're you're here first, talking about a pretty impressive car here. Yeah, um, you know the words "sure thing," "lead pipe cinch," "trust me." These are generally things to run away from. Rob's had a lot of those cars over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Unless to hear him tell it. <laughs> I've got the phone messages to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I believe I still jointly own a lot of Signet with you. Yeah, you're so. a one, you're a one fiftieth owner of a lot of Signet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, and you know, those are all words to run the hell away from, unless you're talking about an E30 BMW M3, particularly the Evo Sport models that we didn't get in the U.S. but are now legal here or starting to become legal here under the 25 year rule. These are going to be the, the career RSs, the 27 RSs of, of the next generation. There was one that Dave and I looked at that sold last year here at Russo and Steel. It was a white car uh, with 40,000 miles on it, and it sold for $40,000, and our jaws dropped. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is, this is a sign of the apocalypse. And a year later, that's a $60,000 car. Yeah. That is a pretty fair return on, on an investment, a 1980s car, in one year, so I, I love these cars as future collectibles. I, I think too that's another another car that um, you know is very much a reaction to what that company is doing now. You know, you get the kind of epitome of the great sweet handling BMW with the brilliant high-strung motorsports engine, mm -hmm. and you juxtapose that with anything that BMW is making today. And if you have like an appreciation for the BMW brand, you say like, wow. Have That's it. when they had it. That's when they had it right. right. Yeah, every that BMW of that era, however, should come with a uh, cherry-flavored Hello Kitty uh, air freshener uh, <laughs> to, to get rid of that unique German interior smell yeah. that's been baked in California sun. So, uh, Is this car analog enough? Is it still digital? Does that play a role in its collectability, Rob? Oh, man, that thing is, it should have zeros and ones written all over it. I mean, that yeah. is that car is, is I think, is totally analog. Um, uh, they're, I mean, they're not even OBD1, right? I mean, 
Yeah, yeah. 88, yeah. 89. I mean, yeah, I, I think, I mean, they're, they're pretty simple. Um, I think they had uh, that terrible BMW, like, miles per gallon computer. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. LED Which failed fails. on before yeah. the warranty expired. But, yeah, I, I, I look at those cars as, as pretty analog. What do you guys think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially from my perspective, like mm -hmm. I, I say, go back a few years and get a 2002 and forget this this entire. That's true. Oh, it's exactly. a fine option. I, I yeah. Like. I mean, uh, talk about analog. I mean, the 2002, uh, you know, it's just a total bulletproof car when you get it. Uh, you know, rust can be an issue in 99.999% yeah. of them. Yeah. But uh, other issue. than that, they're fantastic automobiles. So if I was looking yeah, for... Especially a, the turbo models. Yeah, for a BMW, I would go for a 2002. I um, think, it, you know, this this aesthetic too, the big box flares, the, yeah. the, um, you the, know, the Audi Quattro look. Very much of a period. It's yeah. very attractive to me. It, you know, that's something that I can look back on. Um, you know, again, it was a little bit before my time in terms of like when I was actively looking at cars. Um, but it's it, you know it's incredibly pur purposeful like it's motorsports you know it's mm -hmm. we we why do we have big box flares well we need bigger tires that's why it's mm -hmm. you know it's not because cool. it's stylish or cool like it is now it's mm -hmm. like we're gonna go racing in this thing and we need to make you know we need like to make it into a race car yeah what form following function yeah. <gasps> what a concept <laughs> all right I think that's where Donald that's the perfect yeah. segue man yeah, the nine eighteen this is you're coming out strong with this car. Yeah, um, the whole field of the instant collectible, or the modern collectible, is mm -hmm. uh, one which a lot of people buy new cars, put them away in garages, shrink wrap them. Uh, Dave particularly loves these cars, like the 18-mile... Um, Pickled cars. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, usually Super Beetle convertibles. Great investments there. <laughs> Cosmo uh, Vegas, Bicentennial Eldos. Exactly. <laughs> um, Pace car Corvettes. But there are some cars that define performance design technology... The McLaren F1, of course, is the best example of a true modern collectible. Uh, we're also seeing this, frankly, in the Ford GT, interestingly enough, sure. the BMW Z8. Uh, there are certain cars that have um, really sort of defined what their makers were doing at the time and, and showcased what they're doing in a very uh, remarkable way that makes it a collectible car. I think the Porsche's 918 is for, will be, for a lot of people who grow up with the entire idea of uh, hybrid cars and um, and this kind of technology, a very important car because first of all, I think it's it's one of the prettiest new Porsches that they've ever done. Um, much much prettier than the Carrera GT, for instance. Uh, sorry, I know you have a Carrera GT in this guy. Um, <laughs> and also with Porsche's return to frontline um, sports car racing, I think that the timing is exactly right because that's really when you get the the the, the interest that will really grow with a, with a collectible that has, that has legs because it's got something to back it up. You, you've seen the car on the track, as it were. You've seen uh, things performing. I also think in this uh, group as well uh, that the, the Ferrari, the stupidest named car ever, the Ferrari La Ferrari, um, is also, I think, in this category. It, it looks slightly different. It's an important car technology. Um, and another car which I could also put in here, uh, which is just coming out, is the BMW i8. Mm -hmm. as well. And the i8 actually, I think, has an even more unique look, which lends to that uh, idea. The i8, I think, will be a more important collector car than the M1 is now. If you look at the i8, speaking of the look, just this weekend, if you see one around, uh, it looks like a 911 is coming out of the back end of it. So if you take a look at it in that context, if you see, <laughs> like a you'll see them around this weekend. Like alien? That's exactly yeah. what it looks like. I mean, it looks like it's... <laughs> It's somehow wrapped around a 911. Yeah. You're looking for Sigourney Weaver. Once, once yeah. you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Burned into my. <laughs> yeah. How do you segue to that? To the, the beautiful. Actor anyway, what we're we talking about? Yeah. 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 yeah right. Well, well, what do you guys think about yeah. that? Well, about the 918. I, I, I thought it was line. interesting you chose the 918, considering its freshness and, like you said, everyone's looking for that. I want to buy a classic today that's going to make me money, or at least. Make me the coolest guy on the well, planet. Hopefully they'll drive it. I you would hope so. Don't I'm really drive it. And my generation, thanks to Petrolicious and a bunch of other video things out there, if you're not driving your car, you're not cool. Absolutely. So thank God those exist. But I was really surprised you didn't pick a GT, uh, only because there's a lot of pop culture surrounding it, and there's much a of lot it falls under the category of too soon. Yeah. Right. But right. I think now, that there will be. Stuff around the 918. 918 sort of isn't established. Enough. But I think this this it is also part yet. of that Porsche discussion where the early 911s have something that the new 911s don't, mm -hmm. and I think the the V10 Carrera GT <laughs> has something that the 918 doesn't, 
and it's a lot of that analog, Danger. a lot of that F1, mm -hmm. a lot of that noise that we're starting to miss, even in Formula One with the new motors, everything's kind of going shh now. <laughs> but we're looking at future collectibles, so this right. will be people mm -hmm. that have grown up on a generation of silent F1 mm -hmm. and the like, so e. this, this will be something that appeals to them. So the, right. the 918 for me um, is a, an absolutely brilliant, marvelous car, and I do think it is a future collectible uh, 100%. I think you know, they're collectible now. If you can buy one right. for what Porsche sells them for, you can turn around and sell them for more money. Like yeah. that's that's pretty Instant. good. Definitely but um, shocking. Yeah. I do think that this generation of like supercars and hypercars, to me personally, is kind of like the first of the diminished expectation hypercar uh, generation, where like Ooh. you don't expect to set. You know, like the McLaren F1 came out when I was a kid, and it was it was the fastest car in the world by you know 40 miles an hour, and it was like that's an achievement. And then the Bugatti Veyron came out, you know, I was a little older, and it was like, that's the fastest car in the world by, you know, whatever, 10 miles an hour more. Um, and then this generation comes out, and it's like, well, you can't really... It's like, well, how about 200? 200 good? Well, like, yeah. it was good in 1989. Like, yeah. that was fast. Right. right. But um, Well, then you guys got, got guys like Hennessy who are pushing that 300 mark. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. holy crap. And I think, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a certain point, and, I, you know, in my mind, I kind of view this as like the... Um, you know, maybe maybe we've reached peak performance. Maybe the cars aren't going to get faster from now on. They'll get more efficient and more whatever. Um, but maybe maybe they don't get better. Maybe you know maybe we're on the the downward slide of the supercar hypercar thing. Um, and if that's the case, the 918 is even more interesting to me. Um, yeah, and we'll have the last of an fat. era it's, yeah, yeah, for the, the autonomous the, cars. Yeah, what well, well, I think right. that cars like the 918 do though, and I haven't driven one, um, is that they provide a higher level of performance with greater usability. Mm -hmm. Just sort of chasing the top speed thing and you know, have with the Veyron, like, oh, this is the top speed and your tires will last exactly 22 minutes. Right. Okay, I'm going gonna, 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 gonna to bring this back to cars that actually humans can <laughs> afford. Yeah. Um, the Acura NSX. Um, they're out there now. Um, yes. You know, NSX is just to be about to be reintroduced and let's see how they do with the new one. Um, but this first gen, second gen um, Acura NSX, Still affordable. You can find them. Bad ones for twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars. Good ones, the Zenardi edition, the uh, you know kind of the pinnacle on these, uh, can be seventy-five and up, or even a hundred thousand dollars. <clears throat> they're gold-plated collectibles, as far as that goes. They appeal to all kinds of generations. They're easy to drive. Um, they're the thinking man's three hundred eight Ferrari. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, of course, they never. Uh, sorry, man, Rob. They, Rob, I, Rob just bought a three hundred eight Ferrari. Course, but of course, I don't think they ever made a pink Barbie edition of the Acura uh, <laughs> NSX like they did the three hundred eight. So I could see where you didn't bond with that, but. Uh, um, Moving right along, <laughs> um, there are a whole bunch of uh, cars that are in this category, and I can think of a couple. And one that I think is a a car that we're all idiots for not driving down or walking down or taking a taxi over to the Cadillac dealer and buying a CTSB wagon with six speed. Um, yeah, there's yeah, a car that's brand new that you can finance. They built. Two two hundred and fifty, I think, so far, uh, with a five-speed. I mean, uh, obviously, a lot more with a with a uh, an automatic transmission. But uh, it's a car that has all kinds of great generational appeal. It is faster than just about anything on the road. Uh, it you know it comes with a warranty, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's there, there really is a very long list of uh, uh, future for sale. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, exactly. Diamond black, Step right uh, down. red tune. No, yeah. I, crazy I, Dave. When I saw yeah. when, I, when I saw <laughs> I mean, Dave, we're doing available. now. Yeah, yeah. Hey, when, I, when I saw David Pope had listed this one, I thought, what, wasn't it just a year ago when I think it was Terry Gross on NPR was interviewing Vanilla Ice and she said, so tell me about your supercar, and he goes, what, my Acura? <laughs> And it was one of these things. I'm like, wasn't that just Under a year pressure. ago or two years ago? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's amazing to me. I think that kind of falls into a little bit along the same lines as the two. Okay, if I owns one, I'm out. Okay, yeah. I want you to know. Yeah. Yeah. He had one. Right. He had one. Enough uh, shit there. I'm sure he doesn't own one now. <laughs> right. right. Uh, yeah. He probably had to sell it. For yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. the bank owns that car now. We're, yeah. we're, we were talking about this car at breakfast, and I was telling him it's. The NSX is unique because it doesn't matter if it was the base model out of the showroom floor or a Senna edition or, you know, the, the Pinnacle edition fully optioned out or even a race version. If it has, the, this is a car that actually could benefit from the right aftermarket parts. Mm -hmm. So all JDM parts that are hard to find nowadays that they'll actually have to refurbish or reclave or whatever it is. There's a Mugen, completely Mugen out NSX running around Los Angeles and they're there are plenty of guys that are chomping at the bit to get their hands on it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think that's a, 
um, I agree with Dave and, and Ezekiel as well. It, it's that's a um, it's unique in that way. The the modified cars being more valuable, but I think that's you're you're starting to see that uh, modern cars, mm-hmm. um, you know, especially Japanese cars. That was the whole thing with those cars right. is you buy them and then you make them better. Um, but yeah, I think that the NSX is uh, is about as close to a affordable blue chip car as I can think of. Got it. Yeah, my only uh, cavil with my colleagues, the geezers uh, picks, uh, is the fact that I actually looked into the future, and they looked at cars that are actually collectible now. But just note that. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Donald <laughs> wins. We're done. Donald's in. I think a, a complete polar opposite. We were talking about supercars and modern collectibles, and Dan, I was shocked to see yes. this, this colorful <laughs> edition. And I think you brought a prop. Along yeah. that might <laughs> uh, might support right. your your reasoning here. I think it might round out everyone's perspective. What is with like we call it Malays, the lowrider era? Malays, yeah. Malays. Uh, Malays era. You know, you're talking about uh, and it, there's argument here, but 70, somewhere 40, like 80, 85. 74, 85. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it was but, uh, it was quite. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, sure, uh, Merle Martin, who's a, a car writer, uh, more recent. He started at Jalopnik. He writes for a bunch of people now, um, including Auto Week. Uh, <laughs> but he he defines this era as like the again the diminished expectations, the Carter era. Uh, Jimmy Carter made a speech about a great national malaise, um, right. and that's the decade without quality control. Right, right. and that right. so that's the era. Safety bumpers. Uh, that kind of or that's you know now comes to to include all American cars from like you said, yeah, mid seventies to mid seventies or mid eighties basically. Yeah. That, yeah, that decade. Let's and, say it generally ends when the the Fox body Mustang got a right. new cylinder head, two hundred twenty five horsepower. Yeah. The yeah. Z twenty eight Camaro followed. Oh, was okay. Now that. we then it was okay to be fast. Again. Yeah. Right. And those and even those cars. I mean, th- these things and what I what you see there, like a you know like a, a, a Monte Carlo, you know, seventy nine Monte Carlo, and and by now you can probably tell I'm I sort of focus more on. American iron, but this sort of gets into American vinyl, and American vinyl wasn't really in very good condition back then. Uh, you know, uh, but these things are these things are accessible. They're they're cheap, relatively speaking, and you don't see many of them. And I got into a conversation with a guy who was uh, 30-ish, and he said we were talking about old trucks, and he said, "Oh, I got an old truck." I said, "Yeah, me too." I said, "Mine's not that old." He goes, "What's yours?" I go, "74 F350." I said, "What's yours?" He's like, "92 F150." Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so a guy like classic, that, right? Classic, yeah. you know, like, you got air conditioning. So <laughs> a guy like a guy like that looks at a car like this, and not only does he see accessibility and does he see a, a great Saturday afternoon at the pick and pool, yeah. but he can <laughs> he can also <clears throat> but he can also customize these things. And what we're seeing right now, especially in on the West Coast and in Northern California in particular, is this idea of what's sort of called a low custom. And because there's not really a real name for it yet, but you take one of these Malays era cars, you don't do anything to the interior or motor, uh, you airbag it, or if you've got enough cash, you you know you put a set of hydro- Reds hydraulics on it, a set of cheap 14-inch um, Pep Boys vintage, which there is now, uh, Keystone Classics like in this one here, and a paint job, and you're rolling something pretty cool for under 15 grand, mm-hmm. you know, and this is an old car to these kids. Mm-hmm. These kids. Yeah. These kids. Damn kids. No one. No You like that, right? Do you like that? Do you like the paint on that one? Uh, we'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> He's Look, the one tonight. A like. core sample of one. I like it. Right. Right. Um, and and I and I did bring a prop along uh, to illustrate more of this point. If you're looking at me like I'm insane, it, this will make maybe a little more sense or less depending, but. Um, when we're talking about props and we're talking about what is what motivates this generation, especially the younger or the, the younger end of the scale of the uh, you know millennials, if you want to say it that way, um, is a skateboard, a skateboard deck, and skateboarding is a huge In, part. Invented by the boomers, by invented the way. Invented by so the boomers. Know. Yes, that's true. Invented by the boomers. So you got um, one. And skateboarding has turned into, it's, it's its own culture and lifestyle. And a lot of this generation, especially on the younger scale of it, is growing up with skateboarding. And skateboarding is, not only is it a sport, but it's a sort of a personal expression of art and everything else. So in this case, and if you see this one here, this is a great example. This is uh, a skateboarder named Scott Bourne who's a professional skater. He's, he's actually sponsored by uh, uh, Dickies, if you can believe it or not, Dickies <laughs> Workwear. Um, 
he's got this skateboard deck that was designed by an artist, an underground artist uh, uh, by the name of Jeremy Fish. And if you see what he's got here, it says Born to Run, the play on his last name. Uh, this is a collectible now. This, this deck alone goes for about 250 bucks. A brand new, it was 30. And the influence of skateboarding and skateboard culture di directly ties to car culture because of its accessibility and its, um, its, its, its sort of support of individuality. In a lot of ways, that's hot rodding and car culture as mm -hmm. well. So a lot of these kids are coming to cars by you know, through skateboarding. And skateboarding as an industry has adopted cars and motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And they've really gotten into that, especially the older end of the scale of the, of the millennials and Gen X, especially the Gen X crowd. That's so when you see a car like that, the guy who built that car had it was influenced just as much by skateboarding as a culture as he was by his dad and the movies he had seen and the cars that he sort of grew up with. There's a, a great custom car scene in Detroit now that's all, you know, they get together, park their cars and skateboard and drink beers and right. barbecue. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, you know, but they're building, uh, you know, 32 Fords. They're building, you know, uh, yeah. late 60s uh, Delta 88s on bags and and all the, the same thing. Um, and I do think, you know, I think especially like, you know, this, um, that's a, a great point to bring up this Southern California thing. Um, you know, we're pretty homogenous as a group um, here in Monterey, these kinds mm -hmm. of events. Pretty much, um, you know, old white guys generally. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, we, we do ourselves a disservice to, to look away from, you know, like not only Southern California, but... Uh, you know, a lot of the American South is doing incredible things. Um, you know, I, I always joke that, um, you know, the great collector car, uh, great collections of the future will all have a donk, a box, or a bubble in them. You know, the 30-inch <laughs> wheel, <laughs> S10 framed, uh, 80s Monte Carlos. Um, and I'm actually half serious about that. Or, or you look at Houston with the, the slab scene down there building these outrageous customs. Um, there's, a, there's a huge amount of... of of things that we just don't see, like from from our perspective of the big, um, you know, million dollar collector cars. There's a, yeah. there's a huge amount of young people putting money and energy into cars that we just were not exposed to. So, um, Roy, tell us more about your Audi TT. How does this all kind of like circle back together? Because this seems extreme for what you're you're so here. So the uh, the first generation Audi TT um, was a car that to me was was very very striking. I, I actually asked. We have an intern in the office who's a, a design student at uh, College for Creative Studies in Detroit. Um, he's 22, and I put it to him. I said, "What's what's the next car?" Yeah. And he said, first generation Audi TT, no question." Wow. Um, I think it was hugely influential, um, but it's also unique of that Bauhaus kind of minimalist styling. Um, uh, and it's it's starting to come back around where like for you know five or six years I was looking at those cars and saying oh those look pretty dated the new ones look better mm -hmm. and now you see nice ones and it's like oh wow that's really a special so very interesting looking car mm -hmm. um, so that's that's why I put it on the list I think you know is it ever going to be like a, a blue chipper no they made too many of them but mm -hmm. um, it's a car that that's going to have some appeal, I think. Um, they have special editions. They've got yeah. custom interior. And yeah. really, you know, a lot of interesting stuff with colors. And yeah. um, and they're very tunable, too. That's another interesting mm -hmm. thing is it's there are a lot of people um, building super, super fast first-generation Audi TTs, um, which which could hold some appeal, too. So yeah, Last um, of the napkin sketch yeah. cars. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Build it like this, damn it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I know I'd love to find one that did not go back for the recall to have the little deck with spoiler put yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that hurt. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think Zeke's car's got a spoiler on the back of that. Tell me it's more about this. It's got a few spoilers. Yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. it's, it's extreme here as well. <laughs> yeah, it's... I Explain wanted to what this is, man. Yeah, I wanted to shed some light on Japanese collectibles outside the 2000 yeah. GT. Uh, I think it's in, it's still a niche market. I mean, mm -hmm. Haggerty doesn't even have tracking on it right now. So <laughs> I was like doing my research, like, hey, wait, I can't even find anything on this, so I'm gonna mm -hmm. have to do real research. Yes. So, <laughs> so I did, um, as any good journalist would. Um, so you went straight to Wikipedia, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's the other side. Yeah. No, so this particular car, it was under a thousand produced at this level in one year. 60 were raced, one of the most historic <coughs> Japanese cars out there, winning its Japanese cars in the Japanese racing circuit that 
150 races in its coupe version, 33 races in its sedan version. Straight, it had two different motors that actually put out 160 horsepower, if not more. You know, Weber carbs, easy to work on, readily, uh, not too readily available, but these particular cars benefit from all of its aftermarket gear. It actually benefits from heritage. It benefits from a lot of these things, and this is the pinnacle for a lot of the young guys coming up. Next to the 2000 GT is this. Mm -hmm. And what's the pre-sale estimate of the one sitting out there? Yeah, just 175, uh, yeah. 195. Yeah. Wow. It's it, and that's for an auction. Private sales, they're already going past that. Wow. So Ooh. the the and you're talking about clones that are eking up on 150k, and they're the the regular sedans that are or the coupes that are just massaged out with the right parts, and this car is just that. And there's one actually racing at the Historics this weekend, and I highly encourage you, if you get a chance to go out there and check it out, listen to this thing scream down a straight. It makes BMWs quiver. It just has that kind of visceral Yeah, that's because it doesn't break. So. Yeah. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't need to break. You just lift. <laughs> that's what all the spoilers are for. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I think, uh, you know, quickly, because we want to get to questions, right. but... Uh, but um, for those of us of my generation, when I saw the 175, 195, uh, uh, you know, uh, estimates. Uh, estimates on it, yeah, I was thinking, hey, there's a typo here. Um, <laughs> you know, they missed a digit, you know, that sort of thing, because you really have to readjust your thinking when you're when mm -hmm. you're talking about right. these cars being that value. But yeah, that's what they actually do, and, and See, there's I, a really I, good chance it'll exceed that. I'm I thought it was totally reasonable when I looked. I was like, yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. No, I know, but I mean, you know, if you if you're not accustomed to the market, you'd think. Yeah. Right. yeah. How could this, this is worth this is Donald's of? replacement for the 911. Oh yeah. So. yeah precisely. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Exactly. Far more interesting car. Um, are we going to get to use our props? I slept this prop all. Day. Sure. Oh, you have a prop. Um, we were asked uh, to bring a prop, and obviously we saw one of the props uh, that sort of um, capsulated who we are in our generation. And uh, what I brought, first of all, it's I carried it in this wonderful canvas bag, which is a souvenir from the 1978 Canadian Grand Prix, when there are actually teams that were named after cars and not drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and inside, this thing called... Magazines. Weird. Things what? you actually, you look at the pictures and you turned the pages. And for millennials, um, it, they don't need batteries and they work all the time. You don't have to plug them in. It's amazing. Stuff. It, I couldn't it bring it on paper. astonishing. <laughs> and, and you get, this is the new Jaguar XKE. Uh, wow. And you get all sorts of wonderful alphas. And you get the Studebaker Avanti. Brand new, available in your Studebaker showroom from the advanced <laughs> thinking of Studebaker. And then you can do foreign car magazines that show you all sorts of wonderful things um, about Fiat 1100 sedans that uh, won their class in, in all sorts of little races that you've never heard of. Do they do and video? Those things? <laughs> exactly, they do. Yeah. If you flip the pages fast <laughs> enough, yeah. the cars seem to move. It's really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> On the Q&A, oh, my prop. Oh, that's a good one. It doesn't get any more analog than this. Uh, oh, my goodness. Realistic walkie-talkie. Free <laughs> cell phone. You went on a road trip with your friends. This is what you had to use to communicate with the people in the other car. Now, Only I, if you had a Sunday. I don't, yeah, exactly. I don't, mean, like, I don't mean to blow everybody guy. here away, but this contained an entire album. What? What's an album? <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. It's vinyl. Yeah. And it, wow. it, it contained an entire one vinyl. Uh, and this, I picked this one special because it is on the Motown sound, the Motown label, Rare Earth. Yes. Um, and... Ooh. This one also has the one hit that Rare Earth ever did, Get Ready. And um, it's between track three and four. So, yes, right in the middle of the groove wow. of track Chunk. three, you hear, ka -chunk. <laughs> And then it goes on to the rest of it. That was technology. That was probably recorded within a half block of my house. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's probably right. Old Detroit Sound is right on my block. It's for sale. If yeah. You <laughs> make me an offer. Go to eBay tonight. It'll I'm be sure there. there are a couple in the, in the gutter by my house. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, I appreciate your comments. It's been outstanding, and I think it's uh, it's helped everyone in the room maybe well, feel more comfortable about the future or at least maybe more educated. And let's let's help educate them a little bit more. We're going to open the floor for some, for some questions. We've got Laura and Ashley walking with microphones, and uh, let's focus our questions on the topic today. Uh, I know we've got experts up here who can talk about cars and values. Let's save those types of questions until afterwards. So let's, let's move the microphone around. Laura's got one. Hi, thank you. I've got a uh, 1957 Porsche uh, Carrera, 
and I worry about it and what the future is going to hold because everyone who's 50, 60, 70 loves the car, but I really kind of worry about the younger generation if they think that's going to be a nice car or if it's going to peak in value and start going down. Any, any thoughts on something uh, like I that? Have a, just, just before we answer, or sir, can. pass the microphone to the young man sitting right in front of you. Yeah. He's 15 years old. <laughs> Ask him the question. <laughs> No, I, so do you care about Carreras? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, what about when, when the last guy who knows how to build a four cam engine passes away? That's what I'm saying. The what then? Yeah, yeah is, is the only thing that, that concerns me about that car. I mean, the push rod cars have the benefit of a lot of simplicity. Um, I, I don't know. Donald, what do you think? Um, well, again, I uh, the 15-year-old's grandfather sitting next to him, <laughs> who's a guy who collects... Uh, uh, for Cam Carreras, I think he's trying to work on that. I think that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I uh, valuably comment about the future of four Cam uh, rebuilding, repair, and so forth and so on. I've uh, transformed my entire uh, em car emphasis to four Cams, and using a word that the panelists have used, uh, uh, the. They are so basic, uh, the period of uh, four cams, uh, my interpretation of it is that you can drive them, you hear the engine, and you hear the road, which uh, later cars don't have. But the future of four cams, I think, is solid. Uh, I started collecting them, got rid of all of my eclectic collection of odds and ends, and focused on four cams about eight years ago. And I have the mechanic, <laughs> among others. Are you going to cryogenically uh, preserve him? Yeah, right. <laughs> Pardon? Are you going to cryogenically freeze him or try to, clone try, him? Trying, or? To make sure, trying to make sure that, that there is somebody still yeah. alive to do it. Yeah, I, I think we, you know, we, we do ourselves a, a bit of a disservice as a hobby with, with this, these kinds of, um, you know, are, are they going to be valuable? Are they going to be um, valued by the next generation? I think, you know... What I was saying earlier, if you expose people to these cars, they appreciate them. And if you want to ensure that there are people out there who want these cars or who, who want to take care of these cars when you're gone, you have to expose people to the cars. You know, again, a 4Cam Carrera is a pretty abstract idea when you see it rolling across the auction block. But if you get a ride in one or you see one, you get to hear one listen, you get, you know, or you get to hear one run, uh, you, even if you see a video of the car online, it starts to become a real thing, and um, and not just some you know a rich person's plaything or an old person's plaything. It can become a, a real uh, visceral uh, thing that's that's worth preserving. I think you know that's you know Haggerty does a lot of that type of work, trying to get kids around cars, and um, and we can all do that too as as um, as people who own these cars. You know, share them, show show kids how cool they are. Knowing that people use them, what the uh, the youngsters on the panel said. What's cool about cars to young people is the fact that people drive them. If they're just, you know, on a display somewhere, on a lawn, trailered back and forth, no, they're not going to have a future. No. Absolutely not. We've got another question here with Laura. Uh, how about a Di Tommaso Pantera? Awesome. Oh. Ooh, fun stuff. Yeah. Yep. yeah. There's a guy uh, in our office whose neighbor has one in his garage that was wrecked sometime in period, and we're over there, I don't know, probably... It used to be about twice a month, but now it's petered out to about once every three months. Trying to get the guy to sell the car, um, they're they're fantastic. I mean, they're, yeah. they're so wild looking, and I think mm -hmm. you know for a time it was kind of like, well, they're not Lamborghinis, they're not Ferrari, they don't have the this huge. Um, it's kind of the beauty of them. Yeah. But now it's like it, they're so yeah. bizarre and wild looking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wanted too. one, and I, as usual, I waited, you know, probably I don't know from twelve to eighteen months too long, and I had to settle for a Ferrari. Yeah. No, I mean the beauty of a Pantera is the fact that the transaxle is the most expensive thing on it. Right. I mean, if you know, um, you know, you can you can buy parts at your local Napa store. It's as beautiful as any Ferrari. It was like the last thing that Kia really did, right? Before yeah, sort, of. sort of being absorbed by Ford. Um, but they're 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 fantastic. I love them. I think the only thing that that um, that makes it tough in terms of collectability for Pantera is the fact that nobody actually knows how many of them were built. Mm -hmm. um, but you know they've look. I mean, the market has loved them in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've they've got to be up what 20 percent year over year. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great question. Anything else? Anyone else in the audience today? Let me make sure I don't miss anybody. 
You know, one of the things I wanted to say about the Di Tommaso, and I think yeah. it kind of is probably appropriate for a lot of these things, is that, you know, especially in the publishing business, like a, a brand like Hemmings, uh, we talk a lot about new audience and where this new audience is going to come from and how we're going to talk to them and what are we going to do about print magazines and all these things. And one of the things that constantly comes up in research across the board, whether you're just talking about job markets or whatever, is the fact that um, millennials are willing to spend, and we talked about this earlier, um, money on experiences over things. You know, they, 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 they will spend their, their disposable income on a concert or on a weekend trip as opposed to buying a car, you know, and there's a lot of, of that in the news right now. And I think that if we, if that experience can be translated into sitting in that Di Tommaso, for example, and mm -hmm. showing them how easy it actually is to work on in, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways, or yeah. how accessible the parts actually are. Not that becomes, how accessible the drivetrain is. The drivetrain is, <laughs> yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. The fact that you could do really that, work out. And, we, and we, you know, one of the things that my friends and I are into right now are um, old fiberglass uh, speedboats with big block, mm -hmm. you know, Fords and, and Chevys in because they're cheap and accessible. Um, but that's the experience. So if we could kind of change our, our thinking and recalibrate a little bit and think, okay, well, the way to get millennials into this stuff is by, you know, exposing them to the experience of actually driving them and owning them. I mean, that's a big step in in sort of thwarting that idea that, well, they're not going to buy anything. Well, mm -hmm. they're, when they think about car culture, like the New York Times did not too terribly long ago, car culture is commuter traffic. That's not what we describe as car culture, you know. Um, so driving around town, scooting around in a, in a Di Tommaso for 30 minutes is a huge experience that I think would actually indelibly print on some kid's mind and, you know, turn them into a gearhead almost instantly. I can't see why it wouldn't. And I, I think, too, that that whole, um, you know, that this, this last year, um, Generation Y, I guess it is, the quote-unquote millennial generation, bought more cars than Generation X. for the, So they surpassed Generation X last year in, in new car sales. Um, so I think, you know, you, you've seen this um, kind of consultant-driven, um, study-driven narrative about millennials not being interested in cars. Um, you know, the, the GM, um, we had a discussion recently with, with some people from GM about that, and they said, well, you know, actually our research um, shows that 10% of our respondents um, who are millennials who are under 35, I believe it was, self-identify as car enthusiasts, which is a really high, that's a big number of people. Um, you look at, you know, a site like Jalopnik, whose readership is is primarily under 35 or, or largely under 35, and they get 7 million unique visitors to their site every month. The car culture is alive and well. The car market, I think, the, the print magazine market, um, you know, us uh, as an industry and the, the new car industry has had a hard time connecting with those people, but they're out there. Um, and so that's that's what I say, you know, about about getting people, exposing people to what we like, exposing people to cars. The things are, are intrinsically valuable; they're intrinsically cool and interesting. But it, you have to you have to expose people to them. And and really, like, you know, I think a lot of it is just younger people tend to be in debt. They tend to not have a lot of money. They tend to, um, and just like all of us were when we were in our early twenties, we didn't have a lot of disposable income. So. Um, I think it's it's less gloom and doom than a lot of that research would would suggest. I think again, and, and to your point, you know, get people out there and expose them to your stuff. I've never seen I've never seen a kid come away from an experience with an old car and not be floored by it. Oh, yeah, I've man, never man. seen it. We've got time for one more question here. I'm back with Ashley. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, uh, Alfa Romeo may actually be coming back to this country. Uh, it, it, theoretically, they are. And uh, I'm curious uh, what you would think the advent of the new Alfa Romeo would have, uh, what kind of effect they would have on some of the uh, cars that are out there now, especially the, the uh, late 50s through the early 70s cars, uh, which are somewhat collectible, but they've really not done very much. Well, um, as a old-time LPC, um, if Fiat Auto does not screw up the relaunch, which they are fully capable of doing. They will. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the new Alpha 4C <laughs> is an amazing car, um, which is every much the equal of any of the great Alphas made in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, um, even early 70s. Um, and I think it will have a tremendous effect 
on the interest in older alphas because it's very much related to them and what they stood for. Um, what happens when they actually expand the line to the sedans and the SUVs, um, that's another thing entirely. Um, there anything uh, can happen. And I think that there's actually a great deal of interest in alphas now. The alpha market, I think, has really started to move, even for mm -hmm. the 70s alphas. Yeah, They've it, been it, very it, active it's in, a, in the market it, today. It's a matter of brand awareness. I mean, that's what it, it comes down to, and, and brand awareness helps when you see the ads. But I would, uh, you know, postulate that um, fiat prices have not gone through the roof since fiat has reintroduced um, uh, us to the 500. And Actually, the Cinquecento prices have gone up they, for the old they, ones. But they were, go, they were going up all along. So the, Jaguar uh, is another good example of that, too, right? Yeah. Have they reintroduced Jaguar? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, too. But I think we've seen, you know, with, with the new Jaguar, I've seen a, a really nice bump in, in a lot of Jaguars that were considered not collectible previously. Um, XJS. XJS. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah uh, Donald, you just sold yours. I just so sold mine. Perfect. <laughs> perfect time. Great time. Sold soon. Nailed Good. it. There we go. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you for your time this morning, attendees, and everyone online. Just want to thank you very much for sharing your Monterey weekend time with us. Hope you enjoyed it.